Okay, well today in Psychology of Money at Northern Kentucky University, we have a very special guest. Dr. Alberani is um, very graciously donating his time. He is teaching courses in the economics department, but today he is teaching psychology or psychology students, I should say, and some, some other students taking um, this particular psychology class. And um, so thank you, um, Dr. Alberani, for joining us. And um, I will start off with my first question. I'm a psychologist and a lot of times I feel like the disciplines of psychology and economics overlap quite a bit, but I don't feel like I know very much about economics. And I know my students probably feel the same way. So can you just talk a little bit about um, what economics is and give us a little bit of introduction to the discipline? Perfect. Yes. Thank you so much, first of all, for uh, for having me as a guest and to the audience. Um, thank you for listening to to this uh, this discussion. Um, yes, economics and psychology are actually very intertwined. I believe uh, we share that the same view. And uh, the, the basics of economics is economics is the science of decision making when you're facing scarcity. Okay, so we assume that the world has limited resources. However, our desires and our wants are unlimited. And if that's the case, then there's always going to be a trade-off. You can't have it all, so you're going to have to give up something. And if you give up something, how do you, what's the process that you go through to allocate what you're giving up or what you're gaining? And that's where you get, you know, market systems, capitalism, socialism, and so on. It's uh, how, uh, how the allocation process goes. But ultimately, it's uh, the, you know, the, the study of how you decide on what to consume or produce. Well, that sounds a lot like what we're learning about in this course. So yeah, that's <laughs> okay. good. Um, okay, so my next question actually is a little bit less about the course, but I thought it would be interesting for the students. So you're actually in Oman right now and you figured out the time change for me. Thank you very much. Um, so you very just welcome. completed a, yeah, I would have trouble doing that. <laughs> so you just completed a sabbatical and um, you've been traveling in various countries around the world on your sabbatical and um, we're all stuck at home, not able to travel because of coronavirus. So maybe can you tell us a little bit about Oman and um, you know what it's like, what, what that country is like, where have you been on sabbatical? Okay, so yeah, actually for, for my sabbatical, I spent my time in uh, two, three countries, uh, Ireland, uh, the United Kingdom and, and Oman. Um, I am currently in Oman and uh, we'll be here until airports open. Uh, but in a perfect day, if it, this was, uh, you know, it, it's 7 p.m. right now here in, um, in, in Oman. Um, if the sun was out, there would be a beautiful sunset behind me. Uh, we're right on the beach. Uh, Oman is a beautiful country. If you're an outdoorsy person, you like uh, rock climbing, hiking, water sports, or if you like to be pampered in resorts, it's a great place uh, to be. The, the culture is uh, amazing. It's a welcoming society, very communal. Um, if, if you've been to Ireland, actually, you know, since I spent the part of my year in Ireland, there's a lot of similarities between the Irish culture and the, the Omani culture. So similar that I was surprised. I was caught off guard. I'm like, this, this feels like it's Oman, other than the language differences. And, and the weather, the, the culture of welcoming everybody's family, um, you know, if you see me and we have a discussion that I'm inviting you to dinner or lunch or something, um, from an economic standpoint and a psychology, well, economic specifically standpoint, Oman is an oil producing country historically and has been dependent on oil and now they're trying to diversify their economy. So something that I'm interested in is the psychology of that transition, right? So we always talk about the economics, oh, here's the economic policy, but you cannot implement economic policy without understanding the psychology of people and how they react to those policies. And that's actually what I spend a lot of my time right now uh, working on, on how to prepare people for transitions. Um, it's, it's not just about, you know, implementing the economic policy. People need to know how to operate within this new economy as well. 
that does sound like a lot like psychology, you know, that yes. people are resistant to change and, um, you know, and it can be a little fearful of change, but also change can be great opportunity and be really exciting. And um, yep. so, yeah, that that's really um, fascinating. Uh, it just, you said it was 7 p.m. in Oman and it's 11 a.m. for my students. Okay. So they know what the time change difference <laughs> yes. is. Yeah, it's, and it's, a, um, it's eight hour time difference until we fall until you fall back in the States and there'll be nine hours because they don't fall back here. Oh, they don't. Okay. Yes, okay. Yeah. And um, what's the weather like? So here we've got, you know, regular fall weather. What What is what is it yeah. like there? So it's starting to get cooler today. The high was 97. It wow. is currently it's currently 91 degrees at 7 p.m. So it's uh, it's pretty warm. <laughs> and does it get cooler um, like if during the the winter time? Is, is there a winter, or is it because it's? Yes. It so, does. So our winter is what you're feeling right now in the states. Anywhere between in the daytime, it's going to be in the 70s. At night, it could fall to um, high 60s in the in the in the desert. In the city, you're in between mountains, you're on the coast, so it's going to be closer to mid 70s. Um, the perfect time to travel to Oman, if you're considering it, is any time between October. And I came here in March and it was really good weather. Um, my perfect time to visit Oman is uh, after Christmas, before the semester starts. So spend New Year's in Oman. Well, you've got us interested, so we can start right. <laughs> doing our, our, you know, web surfing and looking at pictures. The pictures of Oman are just gorgeous. It's a beautiful country, so I'm, I hope you're enjoying Perfect. it until you can I come will back. throw a plug out there for the students. If you're interested in seeing the pictures of Oman, I am on Instagram, Dr. Oh. A. Albarani. Okay, great. So they can see yeah. the pictures. Excellent. <laughs> Okay, so we've talked about a couple of different countries. And um, so as an economist, um, what do you look for to see when a country is financially in a healthy position? What are sort of the things that, um, you know, you're looking for? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of people look at the data. So they're looking at things like, you know, what we would call real GDP per capita, which is just the living standard per person, the average income, if you may. Um, which is, will give you a quick guide on whether, where the economy is on the wealth distribution. Uh, but what I like to look at is actually a little bit different. I like to look at what we call institutions in economics. And what we refer to as institutions is really the environment in which decisions are being made. Right? So once again, going back to, to the, this idea of uh, decision making, and countries, uh, even the same country throughout time, could have changing environments. So I like to see, you know, how easy is it for people to plan their future? Can I plan a year to five years ahead? Is the economy stable enough for me to predict where I might be? Because economic growth or well-being, and for you students, for instance, um, the decision to go to college requires you to plan four years ahead because it takes four years to take a, you know, to complete college. Well, if the economy was not stable and you couldn't really make effective decisions, and let's say the economy went through turmoil every three months, then it would not make any sense for you to invest in a college degree. And if this happens aggregate throughout the economy, then we see short time, uh, short term decision horizons which are not, impact, uh, or are not um, conducive for long-term economic growth. So we won't see an economy thriving. So that's what I look at. I look at simple things like, how do people park their cars, right? Like the, the process of parking cars tells you how much people respect the laws of the country. If they don't park in their designated areas or take different um, you know, multiple spots, that tells you that individuals either don't respect the law or don't respect their place in society, which has implications on economic growth. 
So that that's a great segue to my next question. And um, the one thing that's true about this this global pandemic is that it's introduced a whole bunch of chaos. It's really hard to know what financially countries are going to look like even a year from now or five years from now. So as an economist, as you're looking at this pic this picture, United States or globally, what are you looking for for us to get out of um, you know, so much of, of the financial challenges right now? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And it's something that's um, on my mind because I think, um, you know, in economic speaks, we would say the impact of the pandemic is heterogeneous across uh, the population. Different people are experiencing different things. And sometimes it's correlated with education. It's correlated with um, income. Uh, but unfortunately, it's also correlated with race. Um, so there are racial implications to what we're experiencing. Uh, from, from an aggregate standpoint, uh, without going on the micro level, for, so looking at the entire you know, world population, our decision horizon is much shorter right now. So I find with myself that I'm thinking you know, there was a time during this pandemic there and I was like, I, I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow. I'm just focusing on today, right? Because every new day was a new page. Now my horizon is expanding a little bit. I'm going into one month. Recently, I found myself thinking, you know, until the end of the semester. So that tells me that I, one, I'm either getting comfortable with this uncertainty or the, the you know, the world is getting a little bit more stable. I can't tell which one it is. But that's what's happening. Everybody's horizons are shorter in decision making, which has long term implications because now if I give you a thousand dollars, you're more likely to spend it because rather than save it because you're not thinking long term. You're thinking, how do I get the most out of it now? And, you know, something that you and I talked about before the recording started is I find myself thinking that I find myself, you know, in economics, we call it time preference. I'm not sure if you have a similar reference to it in, um, in psychology, but uh, my time preferences are higher. I, I would rather enjoy today um, and, and make sure I have today because tomorrow is not guaranteed. Um, so I, I think we're all shorter sighted uh, you know, now, which will impact um, our long term decision making. So that that's a great segue to my last question because we do talk about that quite a bit in psychology about how you know um you know we have to push people to make these long-term decisions and a lot of times we think short term and we mm -hmm. talk about how that changes over the lifespan you know younger people make those short-term decisions um so there's there's so much overlap from what you're talking about in economics and I'm talking about from the psychology perspective, you'd think that our two disciplines would be overlapping all the time. And yeah. why do you think that is? So, you know, like from the student side of things, you know, uh, why do you think that universities are separated like that, that two areas that have so much in common might not be communicating as much as they could be? Yeah, I, so in the, in the past couple of years or decade, uh, past decade really, We've seen an increase of the use of um, psychology in economics. Actually, there's a whole new field of economics called behavioral economics. And if you're a psychology major and interested in this intersection, look into it. Um, and you know the, the book uh, Nudge is, is based on uh, this field of behavioral economics. I really think it just comes down to access to resources. Like at Northern Kentucky University, for instance, um, it's, it's difficult to uh, have a faculty that operates in both of these fields. So we're all specialized in the fields that we have, and I would like to see more interaction. And this is the beginning of it, right? This conversation is a, an opportunity for us to talk and to see where the connections are, uh, because they are really, uh, I think we both, both sides of the equation would benefit from more interaction here. Well, and maybe that's one of the, the benefits of, you know, this, this new world that we find ourselves in is that we might not have done this had we, you know, still been doing our usual thing and, and not had to do so much online education. So yeah, so this was, this was very fun. And 
I really appreciate your time. I know you're teaching your own courses and your own students, and I know my students will probably benefit. Maybe you'll see them in class one day. They'll cross over. <laughs> I, I, I would love to. I also direct the Center for Economic Education, uh, and one of our efforts is to increase financial knowledge. So this will tie in with the book and, and your efforts. Um, we believe that sometimes individuals make suboptimal decisions. We just can't tell if the uh, financial decisions, if those uh, decisions are a function of lack of information or if they're behavioral economic, um, you know, um, uh, inconsistencies. Um, so if you're interested in that, reach out. We could talk about research uh, in that area. And um, I really appreciate you having me here. This was a quick, quick discussion and hopefully we have more of these. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we will look into the Center for Economic Education. I'll put the link for the students on our course All shelf. Right. So thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.